joyous feast. It's beautiful to be here. I had um, some acquaintances that I made in Arizona, in Ash Fork, actually. There's a woman that lives there. Her name is Vicki. And She's an Orthodox believer. She's Greek. She has a, a, a house that's way off the grid out there. And I met her and her brother. Um, it must have been a couple of years ago now because their, their mother had passed away. And incredibly enough, their, their mother lives, was, and her brother live in New York City. And, but they, they brought her mother's body to Ashford to be buried there. So I went and met um, Vicki and her brother Nick and we had a funeral in a tiny Baptist church. I mean, you can imagine there's not much in Ashford if you've ever been up there. And um, it was kind of almost a one room kind of church. And then we had the, the graveside memorial and laid, laid her mother to rest there. Um, last night, during the night, and I, I've been in touch with them off and on. Um, Vicki spends most of her time in New York City. Um, and her, her brother, Nick, Reposed, he passed away last night, and or perhaps early this morning. And it's a beautiful thing in response to that. When you think about what is the Orthodox response to these things, <laughs> when somebody passes away, or when there's trouble, or when there's suffering. What do we do? We go to church. And, um, and I know that's been one of the most difficult things for people to kind of suffer under over the past months. Is we're in the midst of a pandemic and then the faithful aren't allowed to come to church. Certainly, there's much um, for us to repent of in all of this. And perhaps the longer that these type of things have, have gone on, um, the more that we begin to see um, that perhaps we reacted in a way that's, that's, uh, that's maybe overly hasty. I remember once, I remember years ago, I was in um, New York City. It's another connection with New York City. But I was at an Orthodox parish there. And it was around, there was some kind of political hot issue that was happening. I think it had to do with, with gay marriage or something like that. And I remember the priest when he preached his homily, and I've shared this with you before, but some of you might not remember, and I'll share it again. He said, it was really cold outside. It was the middle of winter in New York. Okay? It's just freezing, you know, like painfully cold outside. And, um, and he, said, he said, how cold is it outside right now? You know? And he said, it's freezing. <laughs> It's super, super cold. And he said, now, if the temperature inside of your body is the same as what's outside, what are you? 
And, uh, you know, people kind of scratch their heads for a second, and then they go, well, well, you're dead. And he said, if the temperature within the body of Christ, which is a living body, becomes the same as what's outside, we're dead. And, um, and he was preaching in that way to encourage people to keep their eyes, their minds, their heart fixed on the kingdom of God, fixed on a desire for union with God, fixed on a desire for communion with God and a living relationship with Him, and not to be distracted from that aim of Christian life by anything else. And now, here's where you come to sort of the crux of the problem. On the one hand, we're heartbroken and frustrated that we've been denied participation in the life of the church. But on the other hand, it's always been the way of Christians throughout history to care not just for the well-being of the soul, but also for the body. You know, like that, <laughs> that's like it's, it's a part of our tradition. And I think that if anything, um, a lot of what's been going on today, you know, what, what we've kind of experienced in the past couple of months has revealed something about the reality, I guess, of how uncomfortable we are with the gospel itself. Because it's full of paradoxes. Our church has saints who near starve themselves and live on pillars in the desert, beaten by the sun for decades, who completely waste away and destroy their physical body for the sake of love for God. We have other saints, such as Saint Nectarios, even though he was a very um, profound ascetic himself and really had to deal with the asceticism of being persecuted in his life. But when you see how he treats his nuns, he found that there were monasteries that he founded where he was the abbot. What did he do? He took very, he always took into very careful consideration the health, the physical well-being of his nuns. If they were doing too much and making themselves too tired, he would say, stop, ease up a little. If they were fasting, too strictly. He'd say, don't do that. You know? And so what are we to say? Are we to be Western rationalists and look at the life of the church just as people look at the readings of the Gospels and say, there's a contradiction here. You can't have it both ways. It's either, it's either got to be one or the other. I'm sorry, but in the life of the church, it's rarely one or the other. It's almost always both and. And so we have this reality of extreme disregard for the well-being of the body, even to the point of martyrdom. And yet we have the reality that the church creates the first hospitals, that the church is full of unmercenary saints, and that we run to the saints and ask for their intercessions for our physical health all the time. You see how there's these paradoxes within the life of the church. The thing that holds them together in unity is not their external form, the way that they happen to look on the outside. What holds them together in unity is that they are prompted by ardent love for Christ, that that is the center of everything. If they're not motivated by that, if, if, if Simeon Stylite is up on a pillar without any love for God, it's useless. It's absolutely useless. And so we have to think, when we do all of these things, we have to think about this reality of our love of Christ being the motivation for everything that we do. And trumping everything that we, you know, the, everything that you know that would 
there would be another consideration, we set that aside and put everything, put our house in order. And so I think that there is much to repent of in terms of not having our house in order in the midst of this pandemic. There's a great deal to repent of in terms of having our priorities all sorts of mixed up in this situation. So that's one thing. Another thing I just want to share with you, um, it's so strange, you know, to look around and see people in masks. I know Father uh, Vasily, when he was in Alaska, so some of our parishes of our metropolis started services, were able to start services earlier. And so in Alaska, I think in Anchorage, the parish there has been having services for almost a month now. And and somebody shared with me that Father Vasily there, when he turned around and saw, you know, the first Sunday that everybody was there, he just started weeping. It's like, what is this? And, um, and again, I do think that there's, there's much that we can repent of <laughs> in all of this. Um, but at the same time, as much as it's a very strange situation, I wanted to share with you something. Um, frequently when I'm here in the morning, you know, by myself, I'm preparing for divine liturgy, I'm doing Frosca Media, preparing the gifts, and all you can hear is, you know, there's a little bit of sound from the street, but especially on Sunday mornings, it's pretty quiet. And, and especially if we have orthro, so then I'm here really early. It's very quiet. And but you hear, you know, the birds that are outside. And, um, and it's just, it's something really beautiful, you know, to hear them waking up and singing. And, and certainly on, on Pascha, I remember when I used to serve in, in Boston, um, Pascha was, you know, we would finish, you know, the sun's coming up, we're, we're starting to leave the church. And again, it's like you're leaving the church, it's the day of resurrection, and here's all the birds are starting to wake up and chirp, and you know? And it's just, you feel this sense of like all of creation rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. And, but for the past couple, several, couple months, it's like I hear the birds, but there's no people. I don't hear your voices, you know? I don't hear people moving around and sort of making the, you know, the, the song of their feet on the aisle as they enter into the church and come up to venerate the icons and all of this other stuff. And, um, and so hearing it this morning was just so indescribably beautiful. To hear the voices of the faithful as they're gathering for the divine liturgy. And as I said, to hear the steps of your feet. And um, so, as much as we have a lot of issues to bear and a lot of things to deal with in terms of following guidelines and all this stuff, and and now I don't know how well you can hear me because there's trucks driving by and we have the doors open and all that, you know. <laughs> so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that we're dealing with. Um, but I pray again, in keeping our focus on ardent love for Christ, we, begin, we can begin to kind of overflow for love, with love, one another so that whether we're in masks and whether we're socially distanced and whether you know however long this stuff continues we can find a deep sense of rejoicing in the faithful gathering again for the divine liturgy amen